Thanks so much, Kent, and thanks to the Farm on Antimicrobial Threats and all of you for a multi-day uh, virtual workshop. I'm sorry that I wasn't able to join you the previous days, but um, the agenda looked fabulous and I'm gonna very much be looking forward to the report. I think there's a lot to learn there. So as you heard, I've been asked to speak a little bit about new vaccines in the midst of an outbreak um, in this um, webinar session that really focuses obviously on optimal use and issues of vaccine uh, uh, confidence. Um, but I thought um, I would back up a little bit um, and just remind us all, first of all, that in the context of this outbreak, um, vaccines are probably still the major ways um, out of it. And I think what I'll do is talk to you both about this outbreak and how the response to this outbreak has applied lessons learned uh, from previous outbreaks, even when in some cases vaccines never really got there in time or never got there um, at all. So obviously, um, we're all sort of um, building the plane as we are flying it when it comes to developing COVID vaccines while we are planning for vaccination campaigns, both in the US and around the world. And while it is that we are thinking about um, vaccine confidence at a time when we don't yet have vaccine candidates to comment about, um, well, about their safety, their efficacy, and their characteristics. And so that, I think, poses a number of challenges both to development, but it also poses a number of challenges to what many of you do in terms of vaccination campaigns and, and vaccine confidence. Um, a really terrific thing, you know, I think about uh, this experience that we're all having is that in many ways, as I think you all know, there's been really unprecedented global scientific uh, collaboration uh, with this new disease. We're looking at new vaccines. We're looking at new platforms and technologies to make the vaccines. But it's also, I think, really important to point out that although they seem really new, many aspects of this are not new. There have been years and years of investments in, number one, looking at the human-animal interface, and it's been great to see Peter participating in this, to think about what are the kinds of diseases that are likely to impact us, and how does our knowledge of that help us get ready for the next time? There has been um, a tremendous investment um, in understanding the coronavirus, um, partly because of SARS and the recognition that sooner or later it would come back to get us, and partly because of an investment, particularly at NIH, in sort of looking at um, prototype pathogens and the work that's been done on the coronavirus over the past few years to understand the important role of the spike protein. And then finally, I think some lessons learned from past experiences, which I can talk about in a minute, we've had a tremendous uh, investment and huge advancement in vaccine platform technologies over the last decade or so. So these things didn't just come out of thin air, but build on success of experience, uh, research platforms, uh, et cetera, that get us to where we are today. So if I think about the experience we've had, and I'll look back and think about some experiences that we had with SARS, with H1N1, uh, with Ebola, and with Zika, all of which resulted in efforts to develop vaccines, some successful, some not, some incomplete. Um, I think that there are some really important um, lessons learned. Uh, a really first one of these, I think, is the importance of getting an early start. Um, and the second piece of this is seeing things through to completion. If I look at the bookends of the list I just gave you, SARS and Zika, uh, vaccine development efforts got underway. They advanced to a certain point. And um, at least, um, obviously, SARS, quote unquote, went away before vaccine was developed. Um, and there was a lot less interest in government funders and others 
in seeing vaccine development through to completion or through to a later stage of advanced development. In the case of Zika, um, vaccines progress quite far and then the US government is, a is the primary funder um, really lost interest and decided it had other priorities. And I think that um, set the stage for a fair amount of reluctance on the part of, ma of major vaccine developers and manufacturers from jumping in early to this event and getting involved as early as they might have. I think um, Ebola in particular taught us how important it was to have an early start and the fact that when the Ebola outbreak really declared itself to be a potential major global problem, there was a vaccine candidate um, partway through a development process that could be dusted off um, and have its development accelerated, which gave us a huge start. And then obviously for from H1N1, I think that there were a number of other lessons learned um, and a couple of them I might just want to highlight. You know, the first is that the US government has a framework for how it responds to novel pathogens, particularly to flu. And when a new strain shows up, um, they begin vaccine development. They take an on-ramp. And then if they don't think it's going to be such a big deal, they take an off-ramp. So you might make a seed strain and then you can stop or as in the case of something like H7 and 9, you might go all the way through the development process and manufacture and store a lot of bulk vaccine in case you might need it down the road. Um, a really important lesson for new vaccines in the midst of an outbreak for me then has been this business of an early start. You can't make up for lost time, but you can always take an off ramp. And I would argue that for new pathogens that show up, that ought to be the default, that we start early and then take an off-ramp or stop development at some point down the road if it's clear that a vaccine is not needed. At the far end of that is the importance of vaccine funders. Uh, and I hear I'll point um, to the US government in particular, but other funders around the world as well, to remain reliable partners um, to our partners in industry so that at the end of the day, our industry partners don't feel so left holding the bag that they don't want to get involved or only get involved late the next time around. The other thing I think that H1N1 taught us was a little bit about pandemic speed. You've been hearing a lot about both Operation War Speed and I hope the efforts from CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, which is where I now work, around the world in which one of the ways in which we're trying to get to vaccines early is to manufacture vaccine before the clinical trials are done, before you even know if it works. Well, where did that come from? That actually came from the H1N1 experience where we did that for flu vaccines. Obviously, it was a lot less risky to do it for flu vaccines because the ways of making vaccines were tried and true. In some sense, they were just earlier platforms, making vaccine in eggs or even the cell-based vaccine, an earlier platform, tried and true. And there had been enough experience with those vaccines that the FDA had agreed to license just as a strain change, not a flu vaccine with a novel strain. I think one of the things that we hold out now as the holy grail is to have other platforms that are much faster, that are much more reliable, that are tried and true, and that are pathogen agnostic, so that as we get more experience with them, we're much more comfortable thinking about a regulatory approach that lets you regulate those as a pathogen change. But we, I think, are still far away um, from that, although um, watching the, the platforms um, mature and getting so much experience with them and think about ways to improve them from this pandemic, I think is gonna take us pretty far forward. So as we are then developing these new vaccines on these novel platforms in the midst of an outbreak, there are a couple of other things that we need to really be thinking about for optimal use. Um, and for vaccine confidence. You know, one of those I think is regulatory alignment. And as we think all know, um, each country has its own 
regulatory system and the regulators are not always um, working together. I think one of the things that we've really tried to promote over the past couple of years, um, again, through CEPI's efforts, has been to bring regulators to the table from around the world to talk early and to provide scientific advice together about how to move forward with vaccine development. And it's been fabulous now in this outbreak to see regulators from around the world, um, particularly FDA, EMA, often the Chinese regulators, African regulators, WHO, all coming together in this forum under this international organization that the vaccine regulators have formed to talk, to share ideas about regulatory science and their thinking, to share ideas about uh, procedures to authorize use of vaccines, to share ideas about how they want to think about vaccine manufacturing, et cetera. But this regulatory alignment and authorization by regulators is going to be absolutely critical to getting vaccines out there. And it's going to end up being a really awkward situation if you have some stringent regulators that authorize a vaccine and others don't. And so that's because you can imagine the kinds of challenges that that will create to vaccine confidence. And so watching them all work together and share ideas and support one another um, has been really gratifying. And I expect that, that that will continue. And I hope again, provide some new models for how we move forward. The other thing I wanna comment on just from a couple of moments is, um, is in part related to this, but this continued focus on safety. So here in the US, you know, we've been having a lot of discussion in the media and other places about the potential for concerns about quote unquote premature authorization of a vaccine and concern that vaccines will not be adequately tested from a safety and efficacy point of view. Um, I continue to think that that's um, unlikely to happen. And I think we all very much appreciate the importance of doing the best we can to be sure that a vaccine is safe and tested in many thousands of people before it's authorized for use, um, both because we want it to be safe, because we want there to be confidence in the vaccine, and because we know that any mistake can put at risk all the vaccine candidates and in many ways risk compromising confidence in the world's vaccine system, which as you know from the past few days is already a little bit shaky. But it's also the case, and I know many of you know this, that some of the most important safety work comes post-release, whether it's post-emergency authorization or post-licensure. It's only then that you have vaccines that are used in enough people that you might be able to detect rarer adverse events, but still ones that are concerning enough or serious enough that you might not want to move forward with a vaccine. So safety monitoring, I think, made a number of real advances during H1N1 when the US government used not only the vaccine safety link and VAERS, but also um, used in a much different way um, information from the healthcare system itself to do surveillance for vaccine safety signals. And health IT and the ability to do that is much better now. Um, and so that I'm hoping that we can expect that safety monitoring will be much more robust even than it was 10 years ago. And that also that there will be continuous, clear and transparent information about adverse events following immunization um, to, to the public. Um, and I think that's something that we'll really need to keep our eyes on, but it's gonna be really, really important as people experience just events, events by chance after an outbreak um, and attribute them to vaccines. Maintaining vaccine confidence is going to be about helping people understand what the data look like, what the safety monitoring looks like, and um, being and, and having the public confident that you're telling them the truth. When you move from here to looking at vaccines on a global scale, um, both the challenges and the opportunities get greater. It's 
my expectation, um, number one, that there will be a couple of different vaccines that become available in a relatively close proximate time to one another, and that a number of those um, vaccines probably will have a fair amount of use in a number of high income countries that have got strong pharmacovigilance systems, um, maybe first. So this presents the opportunity, if you will, for all of those strong pharmacovigilance countries to think about whether it's possible to get together to use the same safety signal definitions to pool their data and to do so quickly so that you have the potential to detect um, any adverse event signals earlier. And frankly, then to be able to share that information with countries that don't have such strong pharmacovigilance systems so that you can start with a really strong base of information for those countries and those systems and potentially even help them strengthen their systems and understand where it is that they might want to focus, understanding that they may detect different kinds of signals um, than you do. So this cross-country global collaboration about safety monitoring, in my mind, is going to be really key to optimal uptake, really key to the role in confidence, and really key to what I know that you've all talked about in some great detail. Um, in terms of how it is that you deal with rumors and how it is that you deal with misinformation. Having um, really solid, reliable, verifiable information uh, to use in that setting, I think, is, is going to be um, incredibly helpful. So I want to shift a little bit um, now to, to just sort of highlight both the system we have going on in the US for vaccine development and the system that we have going on in much of the rest of the world for vaccine development. And I will tell you that before I started working um, in this, this global arena, I think I really took many aspects of the US system for granted. So in the US, we've got, you know, terrific set of systems that invests in the basic science, that invests in surveillance, that does the advanced development through BARDA, that pays for through US government funds that are available from Congress, that pays for the scale up of manufacturing, that pays for the manufacturing itself, that is able to provide companies a financial guarantee that if they make the doses, somebody will buy them and then um, uses um, systems developed through CDC and in collaboration with state and local governments, ultimately to distribute and administer the vaccine. And that's all um, somewhat end to end financing in a way um, through the federal government. And in fact, the federal government also has responsibility as we just talked about for the pharmacovigilance systems. Well, the world isn't really put together that way. And so um, if I think about what's been going on in the rest of the world, um, actually somewhat prior to when the US government really got going in earnest with vaccine development, um, CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, um, looked at the portfolio of vaccine candidates that had been working on prior to the outbreak. And those included vaccine candidates for diseases that might have epidemic potential, including MERS, and they included um, platform technologies that could be used in the event of disease X. And you'll remember that um, a whole host of pathogens, including Lassa, Nipah, MERS, et cetera, as well as disease X have been on the WHO priority list. So round around January 7th, just before the gene sequence was posted, we actually reached out to the developers of the MERS vaccines and the developers of the platform technologies and basically asked them, would they please get working on a vaccine um, and pivot their efforts as soon as the gene sequence was posted and that we'd figure out over the next couple of weeks how to get them the money to get started and to make that whole. 
And then over time, as we know, the US government invested uh, many billions of dollars in vaccine development, which has been really welcome. And China has proceeded with its own vaccine development. Well, in contrast to what's gone on in the United States, as we move forward with vaccine development, then came the realization that, well, gosh, there was nobody whose responsibility it was to fund phase three pivotal clinical trials. There was nobody in the world whose responsibility it was to scale up manufacturing capacity as, been, as has been done in the US to manufacture large numbers of doses of vaccines. And there certainly is nobody's responsibility to pay for that. There's no entity that has responsibility to make an advanced purchase commitment or advanced market commitment to vaccine developers so that in fact, they would manufacture doses at risk before we know that clinical trials show that the vaccines work, as is the case in the United States. And so the whole, and ultimately there's no entity that had global responsibility for buying vaccine and distributing it in an equitable fashion around the world. And so all of those are components of a global system outside the US that are being built as we go. So the something called the, the uh, clunky name, the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator, the ACT Accelerator formed um, as a partnership between WHO, a number of other global organizations and a number of companies to think about all of the kinds of products that might be needed to end this pandemic. And within that, there's a vaccine pillar um, that is co-led by CEPI and Gabi with an, a lot of involvement for, from WHO. And through that now, um, the rest of the world has worked through systems to um, do this financing, to um, raise funds um, really with the leadership of the European Commission to do this advanced development, to do this and pay for the scale up and development manufacturing. And as we speak, I think CEPI and Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccines, um, and a whole host of countries are coming together to, I hope, finalize some agreements on how it is that they will make um, advanced commitments to purchase vaccine um, together as a large buying coalition or a combination of coalitions. So the companies can finish their scale out of vaccine, their scale up of manufacturing um, and manufacture as we are doing with project warp speed, operation warp speed, so that by the time trials are done, we'll have enough vaccine to start distributing it to the world. And then together with WHO, they've been working through a global allocation framework um, to ensure that frontline workers around the world and priority populations around the world um, get vaccinated first. And all of the data and modeling have told us that vaccinating people around the world in those kinds of tiers will A, end the pandemic faster and stimulate faster economic recovery than vaccinating all people in any one country. So while that's all going on, the rest of the global partners who take responsibility, especially in low and middle income countries, I mean, uh, low income countries, um, for distributing vaccine, uh, helping with vaccine campaigns, and all of those things are getting going with planning and practices within countries to enable them to distribute and administer vaccines, but also doing some really important work now to think about vaccine literacy, vaccine confidence, and set the systems in place to understand people's current confidence in vaccines, what their issues and concerns are, and probably on a country by country and population by population basis, do everything they can to use everything that we've learned a lot about and what you've all talked about the past few days to optimize the chance that once we have a vaccine that is safe and effective, um, that there will be enough vaccine acceptance that we can shut this down. It's not gonna be easy while we um, as a country are pretty paralyzed by this pandemic, other countries, particularly some low income countries, 
still have um, lots of morbidity and mortality, lots of death from other kinds of infectious diseases. And so on the one hand, you know, we're hearing a lot of enthusiasm for this whole global system and for other countries vaccinating their population. And on the other hand, we're hearing from some countries questions like, what do you do when people are more afraid of the vaccine than the disease? So we have a lot of challenges ahead of us, but I think that um, everything that we are doing as a global community in particular is setting the stage for how we continue to do this um, bigger, better, faster in the future. My hope for the future is in addition that in terms of where the US government has been, that we not only have scientific collaboration and regulatory collaboration, um, as we have had tremendous collaboration both from NIH and from FDA, but that we also have collaboration in terms of development and shared financing um, and a view that we're all in this together when it comes to making vaccines available to the world, since we all know that none of us are safe until all of us are safe. So Kent, why don't I stop there and uh, hand this back to you for questions, comments, okay. other sorts of things. Great, mm -hmm. Thank, thanks so yeah. much, Nikki. Um, yeah, we have a, a number of questions. Um, so let, let me lead off. So, you know, given fortunately the episodic nature of pandemics, that is they don't happen very often, Fortunately, um, but as you spoke to the issues of of CEPI and Gavi and others trying to facilitate, you know, some of these global solutions. Um, as you mentioned before, um, Zika was sort of a flash in the pan, you know, and then for re reasons that I think are, were predictable from epidemiology, the threat lessened and interest was lost. So, given the episodic nature of these pandemics, how, how do how do these again, planning for success, that, that these initiatives really pan out and we have truly global solutions that are equitable, um, you know, well-received. How do we sustain that uh, in the context of things that only occur rarely? You know, I think it's a, a critically important question. And, and you know, let me, let me answer it in two ways. One is I think that we need to make a commitment that when we start vaccine development like this, we take it through to a stage of development that um, so that we'll have vaccines to really rapidly, frankly, resp respond um, if the vaccine shows up again. I very much believe, for example, that we should have done that with Zika. If COVID happens to go away um, before we have a safe and effective vaccine, we've got to get vaccines through the pipeline uh, and get a certain amount stockpiled so that when it comes back, we can respond. Um, the second thing I guess I would say is this, this whole situation has taught us a huge amount about the need for global financing and, and financial preparedness in a really different way. You can't be passing a tin cup in the middle of a pandemic. That's really absurd. And so my own view is that as this gets under control, all the global players are going to need to come together and ask the question about how are we going to finance this and the response to a next pandemic. And I believe that we need to have a system that when new pathogens show up, we agree that we're going to take an on-ramp. We're going to do some of the enabling science work to decide if we need a vaccine, so we have one in time. We will use and continue to perfect platforms and start vaccine development. And then if we need to take an off-ramp, we can, but that should be the cost of preparedness. And if the cost of preparedness is 10, 20, 30, 50 million dollars a year, whatever it is, it pales in comparison to the 350 billion dollars that we're losing in GDP every month. And so I think we, whatever global financing system and financial reserves we have, have to expect to spend this much money every year as the cost of preparedness. It keeps you practiced. Uh, it keeps products moving forward. It's, um, I think, fair to companies, to developers, to the scientific community, and to communities um, to be prepared. And I, I see that issue about sort of the financing preparedness 
almost right now is a bigger issue than the scientific preparedness going forward and something we have to solve as a world. Yeah, some, some would, would even characterize it almost as, as an insurance policy. As an insurance, it's a premium that you pay uh, mm -hmm. to prevent the bigger issue later on. Um, okay, so a question from the attendees. Uh, if you can comment, are there any positive experiences in learnings, case studies, testimonials, et cetera, in addition to what's been published from the early use of Ebola vaccine with health workers that can be adapted for confidence building uh, more broadly as we think about, you know, regional, national, global uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccination programs? Yeah, sure. Um, and I think that there's, I think a lot of it's not even early experience now, right? But, you know, I mean, very important experiences that helped us understand that people don't really understand the concept of a vaccine and what it is, but that it is possible um, to sit with trusted community leaders and explain that and um, have them move on to explain that to people. And that at the end of the day, everywhere in the world, it's about trusted community leaders understanding what's going on and commuting, um, communicating information to their populations. I think the practices that UNICEF and MSF in particular had of establishing these listening posts and trying to take uh, the pulse of populations um, hear and disseminate what it was that they are learning. And they did a great job um, both monitoring social media in areas where the Ebola uptake and the Ebola outbreak was going on and being on in the ground in communities, just talking to people about what they believed and were hearing was really essential and really, really essential to the um, explanation, acceptance, and the ability to ultimately get um, to where we need to go. One other thing I will point out, and for me, it was just an, a quick anecdote that was um, incredibly important, but it, it really speaks, I think, to the importance of good science and um, the power of randomized controlled trials. So, you know, I have a, a very strong memory of sitting um, with the HHS secretary, NIH colleagues, and the president of Liberia when she came to talk to us about Ebola vaccine and the Ebola vaccine trials. And she said, my people are telling me that the vaccine is making people blind. And we not only needed to sit and have a conversation about how vaccines work and that it's Ebola that makes people blind and not the vaccine, but then also had the opportunity to explain in, in um, very understandable terms what a randomized control trial is and the fact um, that the blindness was happening um, in people who were in a control group or in a placebo group and not in a vaccine group and why the vaccine would um, help avert that. But it, again, um, both helping people understand what a trial is, having a trial design that lets you answer those questions, and then having those listening opportunities are really important. And every country, every culture, every language is going to have a slightly different way of approaching this. And um, having anthropologists on the ground, collecting this information, doing this work, and feeding it back is really important. So, you know, I think a WHO view now is um, when we send epidemiologists, we send anthropologists. Okay. Um, so I wonder if you can comment, we've spoken, we've talked about money, financing, mm -hmm. uh, both for uh, developing vaccines, um, uh, manufacturing vaccines, deploying vaccines. But if we think about, again, in, in the context of the coronavirus situation now, if you think about, you have pallets of vaccines or however it comes, um, but then you have to send it out to countries, low and middle income countries where they don't have the infrastructure to, to deploy it. Um, I, I can remember doing work in West Africa and, and seeing hospitals full of, of, of babies with, with horrible measles. We have measles vaccine. They just couldn't get it out to the population. So when we talk about a, a global vaccine vaccination program, um, how do we, separate from just the money aspect, you know, what, what sort of mechanisms or approaches should be considered in, in terms of really 
helping these countries to, to adequately vaccinate their population? Great question. Um, and, and others also may want to jump in here. But, you know, my, what I would say is in general, you know, you can't just start a system from scratch. You need to build on the system you have. And fortunately, most, not all, but most low and middle income countries now have systems through which they um, distribute childhood vaccines. They have childhood vaccination programs. Often their childhood vaccination rates are higher than those in the United States. Um, and there are systems, there are supply chains. There's amazing work through Gavi, through UNICEF, through a number of NGOs um, that, that help with that. It's, obviously it's not perfect. If we end up with vaccine that requires a minus 80 cold chain, probably only the handful of countries that have done this with Ebola vaccine are gonna be able to handle that um, for the foreseeable future. So there's gonna to need to be, you know, there a fair amount of technical assistance. But that work has already started. So, you know, one comment I will make is a lesson from H1N1 again is the US decided, um, you know, partway through that, that it wanted to share a percentage of its vaccine with WHO to distribute around the world and did. Well, it turned out countries weren't anywhere near ready to accept it and to have a plan to use it um, from a whole variety of things. And so, you know, from that came a whole series of planning and preparedness checklists and understanding all the steps involved. And, you know, countries are already being asked to plan a vaccine campaign and look at all of the pieces on that checklist and get the logistics in place. Low and middle income countries are not only getting, you know, that will not only be getting vaccine, you know, paid for it by Gavi, but they've received funding from the World Bank uh, to uh, which they can use to put together vaccine plans and vaccine campaigns and if needed, hire the help um, that is needed. Um, and do it in a way, I hope, that really continues to strengthen their capacity, to build on the strengths they have and strengthen their capacity to do this going forward. Okay. Um, another aspect having to do with, with confidence in vaccines is the whole issue of adverse events. Yeah. And we know, certainly in the U.S. and, and other, other countries, there are a variety of systems for reporting adverse events. And we have um, self-reports, the, the VAERS system, which, you know, they're, they're really uncurated, you know, um, anyone can report anything. So when we think about big picture, again, going, going to COVID, but it doesn't have to be just that, um, as we think about sort of instilling confidence in the populations, um, how, do we, how do we think about, or is there a better way, or I don't know, just what your thoughts are about really true vaccine adverse events versus unrelated medical stuff that's just reported that may or may not be, you know, germane at all, but, but nonetheless, it's in the report. Right. And, and, you know, we see this play out in the U.S. all the time, right? I mean, we, how many people have you seen who told you they got the flu after getting a flu shot, right? Um, so just as a really simple example and a reminder that this happens all the time, or God forbid I had a flu shot and I had a heart attack, or I had a flu shot and I had a miscarriage or whatever. So, you know, in the US, um, one of the things, again, that we worked really hard on in H1N1, and I hope we're working on around here, is, is thinking about what are the background rates of common things, whether it's Guillain-Barre syndrome or other sorts of things, so that, um, and, and to develop really clear case definitions of things that might be vaccine adverse events, as opposed to the things that might just happen by chance, and then getting the background rates of these. Um, at CEPI, we've been working with the Brighton Collaboration folks um, to look at the particular kinds of adverse events that might be unique to COVID vaccines, particularly in terms of either antibody dependent enhancement or lung pathology, and to develop definitions of those to disseminate those. So hopefully, frankly, all countries could choose to use and have a harmonized set of definitions for potential adverse events. And then to do work now before vaccine is available to understand what the background rates of those are. So that just as we do with anything else, we start to look at whether or not 
the rates of reported adverse events exceed what the normal expected background rate is. I think that's the kind of work we have to do and the kind of thing that is going to be a real challenge to communicate um, to the public because as you said, things are going to happen. They're going to be completely unrelated to vaccine. They're going to happen by chance alone, but people will attribute them to vaccine. And the increasing challenge we have now is that social media uh, amplifies um, those um, associations and attributions and all of those other things. Um, and some of it is not maliciously intended and some of it is. And so the work on the back end of this to maintain public confidence is going to be really important. But I think you can only do that by doing this front end work now, getting those background rates, helping people understand what they are, disseminating them, uh, standardizing the definitions. Um, and that's where my point about let's do this now in a bunch of higher income countries that have got good systems um, so that we can share that information around the world. Okay, um, probably the last question, but let me follow up on reporting. So um, we focused on adverse events. Um, again, when we consider a, a national, regional, global deployment of a COVID vaccine or vaccines, um, how, do we, how do we think about detecting vaccine failures, especially across, you know, when you're doing a clinical trial, you have a fairly well-selected population you're testing in, certain demographics, ages, medical conditions or not. But now we're, we're talking about, you know, a global vaccine in all comers, presumably at some point. How do we, how do we think about detecting vaccine failures? And, and in, in doing so, again, doesn't mean the vaccine's bad because we know that perfectly good vaccines don't work in everyone. But of course, as you say, you know, everything gets immediately um, amplified by social media instantaneously, it seems. You know, and, and so how do we do this thoughtfully so we can understand, because I think this is still a learning process as we go along, so we can understand, you know, the, 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 the really the strengths or weaknesses of a particular vaccine. Yeah. You know, it's such a good point, and that challenge is going to be compounded if we're using multiple vaccines out in the field at once. And also because we don't expect that these first wave of vaccines are going to have anywhere near 100% efficacy, right? We think some of them could be like flu vaccine, they could have 50%, you know. Um, and so there will be breakthroughs and failures. On the one hand, you need to understand if those breakthroughs are associated with bad things um, or if they're just associated with run of the mill COVID. And this is a place, again, if you look at the global system, um, it's not necessarily anybody's responsibility to do those phase four studies, to pay for them. And yet I think the lift and the burden for doing that is going to be really enormous. And um, as we are building this plane of flying, you know, I think it's something that we've all got our eye on and our sights on. But right now I will tell you that I have, right, I have not seen um, plans to be able to do the financing that far into the future. And yet we're actually gonna have to do it and we need to keep very much our eye on that ball. Obviously, there are study designs that will let you do this, but again, they require the ability to collect data that are easier to do and organize health systems, um, right, where you can link the information about the receipt of vaccine to information about hospitalization or visits for COVID, et cetera. And we're gonna have to do that, and I think it's the countries with those systems that are gonna have to carry at least the initial burden for doing that. Okay, great. Well, I think we're at time. Uh, Nikki, thanks so much. Um, sure. Thanks to all who, who submitted questions. Unfortunately, we couldn't get to them all uh, given the limited time. Um, I think I'm gonna turn it over now to the moderator of the next session, uh, Alison Buddenheim, who will take it uh, for session four.